because those are really the only places uh, that enable this work, that give us the time as filmmakers and the resources to do this kind of work. So uh, these times in particular, to remember that. Um, Introduce these folks. Um, let's start down here. Mark Samuels is the executive producer of American Experience and the executive producer of this film. <laughs> Gary Flowers, we're recognized from the, from the film. Yes, uh, and responders <laughs> into the Murrah building. One of the people who spent the most time in the Murrah building that day pulled out people saved countless members of lives, a real hero. Mark Hotak was a journalist at USA Today and covered all of these events, was very deeply embedded in this story, um, and is one of the leading experts on this entire field. Okay. Emily Chapman, a producer, um, every bit of that archival footage and photographs you see in that film was because of Emily. Lena Garrett, who since losing her child, one-year-old Kevin, has spent the next 20 years trying to make something positive uh, out of this experience, a message of love and hope that she spread throughout home and the world. John Plessy, our incomparable editor of the film. Susan Bellows, who's the senior producer for American Experience and the senior producer for American for being here. Um, I just want to start off with a couple of quick questions that I'll open up to the audience. So um, one, one is sort of when did this project get started and how did the political climate at the time sort of, uh, sort of inspire it? Mark uh, it was about a year and a half ago that um, I was looking into the story of the biggest act of domestic terrorism in our country's history, which alone I thought deserved the, a film. Uh, and I realized that the more I read, the more I read the work of Mark and others, the more I realized that it was actually a, a, like a, a plant that has an enormous taproot that goes down and down and down, and that we needed to follow that through. We didn't predict when the film would come out. You can't, we don't have that kind of crystal ball. Um, so it, it, the fact that it has acquired a different sort of resonance in the present was not intentional. We just, we thought it deserved attention in and of itself at any time, because this this phenomenon of the rise of anti-government extremism is as old as America itself. Uh, if any of you were, remember falling asleep in eighth grade for Shays' Rebellion textbook, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but being released now within this climate, um, you'll be releasing Gaffley and also on, on American Experience on PBS. What can you talk a little bit about, sort of your uh, your ability to engage with uh, audiences that might be sort of on that all right side, that might be sympathetic in some ways with some of the nationalist uh, anti anti government tone of the film? You know, this is a work of history, uh, and we don't pretend to be experts on the alt-right or what's going on today. In fact, it's usually bad history when you conflate it with things that are going on today. There's a difference between journalism and history. Uh, we have the luxury of looking backwards a long time, seeing things in context. 20 years from now, there will be lots of work and films done on what's going on today. <coughs> you know, this is the past, and we want to keep it in the past. Whether people make connections on their own, that's for the audience. So let's talk about that past and then the research, the amazing research that went into Polinka, not only this story, but Ruby Ridge and Polinka and all the other films that are part of the film. Can you talk a little bit about that research process, how long it took, and sort of putting it all together? It was an enormous research effort. Um, I will say that we had the benefit of some fine work done by Mark Potok and others in the film. You saw those guys, those guys have lived this story for decades. There's, there's a remarkable group of people who have followed the white supremacist movement at great danger to themselves um, and, and have produced some really wonderful work. So we were able to take advantage of that. We went far beyond that. I mean, there are oodles of government reports on all these events, but we also went out to the field and talked to as many 
people who could have were involved. Um, we actually got so deeply into the Ruby Ridge story that Mark decided to spin it off as its own film. So we will have a Ruby Ridge film in addition to this film. Uh, so it was, a, it, was, it was a fascinating experience. And more for me, uh, the, the what's I'm sure for most of the audience as well, so it's a very striking at the very end with the audio footage, uh, the audio recording of uh, Timothy. How did you track that down? How did you help with that? Um, so Blue Michelle and, and Dan Kozak, who are in the film, um, they, they're journalists from Buffalo, New York, and they, um, they ended up being one of the only, only journalists who were able to speak directly with McVay and they had about 60 hours of interview uh, audio, and um, they were gracious enough to share that, share that with us, and we, um, we listened to it together. I'll just add quickly that that experience of listening to that tape was chilling to the bone. I mean, this man, this, he was on death row at the time. It was not a trace of remorse. There was a sort of braggadocio about it that really sort of underscored who he was in a way that nothing else could. Um, I'll open up to the audience. I've got more questions as well, but I, I do want to give you a chance. Uh, mm -hmm. sir. I, I think there's an interesting element in the film about bullying and how, um, I, I just wonder, in any, any of that footage or uh, audio that you listen to, does he ever acknowledge that he himself could be a bully in a way? And then that, that you know, you know and did you guys ever sort of explore that? So I'll just quickly repeat that. Um, it's striking to the audience member that uh, about bullying, and so he's wondering uh, in any of that audio footage, did, did I mean, they ever acknowledge that he himself perhaps becoming a bully and, uh, and sort of repeating that cycle? No, I don't think McVeigh ever saw himself as a bully. McVeigh saw himself as a great revolutionary hero in the vein of the great, you know, forefather, our, our, our founding fathers. Um, he honestly thought of himself as. Um, the sort of spark that would start another revolution. I think you heard that in the film. Um, but you hear it more on the audio tapes that he, he made for Dan Herbeck and Lou Michelle. It goes on and on about how his biggest disappointment was that others didn't follow his lead and, and that there weren't more such acts. And he really expected that to happen. And how could it not happen? He really was bewildered and, and sort of um, couldn't figure out what had gone wrong with his master plan. It does seem to be a characteristic of these sorts of people that they don't see themselves as inflicting harm. I, I can't explain it any other way. They see themselves as only sort of soldiers of, of goodness and soldiers of righteousness. And, and the victims, the individual victims, don't really penetrate. It's the government they're attacking, not human beings. And I don't have an explanation for how, what psychological sort of process lines up with that, but that does seem to be characteristic of these terrorists. And he never showed any remorse with the children that were completely yeah, claims from. he never knew there were children in there. That's very, very debatable. Mark, why don't you answer that, about whether he knew he knew there was a daycare in there or not? Well, I don't believe it for a minute. Uh, you know, that's what he told uh, the two Buffalo journalists. Closer, sorry. You know, that's that was the claim always. The fact <laughs> is, is that standing below the Morrow building, right where he parked the rider truck, you could look up and see the silhouettes of the children, uh, pictures uh, that the kids had drawn that were up on the wall. So, you know, I think it's worth saying that the way uh, McVeigh described the children, among others, was collateral damage. Uh, you know, that was his military term for what had happened, uh, and it was uh, too bad. Uh, at one point he said, uh, you know, uh, he wish, wishes that all the grandmothers and grandfathers and uh, mothers and fathers would quit their complaining uh, that this kind of thing happened every day. Uh, people day, die every day of the week, uh, and uh, as Barrett said, uh, you know, he was going to be a great revolutionary hero. Uh, so I think that it was that simple to him. Uh, it was all about the body count. Uh, let's go right here, please. Now, I, I want to thank American Experience for taking on this subject at this even though it was before this particular moment, it's very relevant to this particular moment. There's two names I want to ask about. Uh, one is to the director of the film, is Janet Reno. My memory is that she was much more involved or accused of giving permission that allowed what happened in Waco to happen in the way that it did. The other name is Steve Bannon. 
and I want to use the word white supremacist, not alt-right. I'd like to know personally how you feel about having a white supremacist now as the chief advisor of the elected president of the United States. So the first question is Janet Reno. I'll let Mark answer the second question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see Janet Reno as, a, as, a, as an extremely tragic figure. Um, you know, this was, I think, her third day on the job is when Waco happened, uh, the, the original raid. She walked into this, and it, it was an absolutely impossible situation. I, I have great respect for and empathy for the FBI agents on the scene. Yes, there were mistakes made, but a lot of that is... 2020 hindsight, we were able to put ourselves in their shoes, and it was very, very difficult to, to, to you know, to see any other course of action. You know, they were there, there for 51 days. There were there were deteriorating conditions in that compound. There were allegations, probably well founded, of uh, child sexual abuse that had happened previously. Now there were exaggerations, there's no question about that, in trying to sell Jan, a reluctant Jan Reno on this plan. Some of the FBI higher-ups exaggerated some of the dangers to the children inside. That said, Janet Reno was extremely cautious. She turned down this gas plant several times. She wanted proof that there was no alternative. And I think it's, I feel that ultimately no one could have predicted this. I'm convinced absolutely that the Davidians set the fire themselves. And therefore, I, I didn't really see Janet Reno as a tragic figure in this. I'll take the easy question. Um, <laughs> uh, American Experience has been on the air for 28 years now, and this week marks my 20th year with it. Susan and I have been working together for 12. And if I've learned anything, it's that history has a tremendous amount of value. It can really, I think, enlighten us as individuals, and I do really believe that it can unite us as a nation, knowing about our shared past. That's the value that I think looking backwards to understand the present offers. And as a series, we do not chase the ramifications into the present from headline to headline, from administration to administration, from crisis to crisis. So with great respect, I defer. Well, that's why I said a personal respect. My question was a personal to the, to particularly the, particularly the Sorry, people most the of. Question. There's a yeah. lot of other questions. Really but I'd like to ask the mother of yeah. the children how she feels about it. Sorry. That was my question. Yeah, I, we've been asked that question before. I don't think that the protestations about the victims in Iraq came from a sense of compassion from Timothy McVeigh at all. I think he had begun to form a bitter hatred towards the federal government. So he, he chose to see the war as an example of the federal government's bullying, its, out of, its being out of control. I don't think it was for a sense of real remorse that he had been involved in the war. I just, I don't believe it. Um, never showed any other kind of remorse for anyone. So it's, it's hard for me to sort of feel that was real. So except for one last question, I'll go to the very back right there. Uh, in, in dealing, in interviewing white supremacists and people who you otherwise think you have nothing in common with or have such a kind of division, were there ever points of common ground or understanding that you were able to kind of find in, in people that might uh, first of all, I would say, I'm not sure if we actually interviewed anybody who currently identifies as a white supremacist. Um, I, I actually became quite close with um, the, the Weaver, the daughter of the Weaver family, um, and there's certainly commonality with everybody. I think. Um, I think this, that's a wonderful, and it's a great question because it's something that I've um, been considering throughout the whole, the whole process is that um, there can be different viewpoints, but we all at the core, um, person to person, can find humanity in each other. So unfortunately we don't have to wrap up. I do want to thank you all for being here, especially.